I'm Dave Rubin. I am the host of The Rubin Report, which I started in September of 2015, which seems like many lifetimes ago. Ben Shapiro to my left, ironically, <laughs> Jordan uh, Peterson to my right. Cops are more willing to shoot if the uh, perpetrator is black What's your data? than white. What's your basis for saying that? What do you know. think that's about? That sort of like sucking of fun? Because I do think there's a reason, there's a reason the fun oh, no. sucks. I'm gonna marry a dude, go ahead, and you want to smoke weed you, you, You're right, well, I, I tend to agree with both of those things I agree with. And you know, the world was getting smaller, right? Everything was becoming Snapchat and Vine and eventually TikTok, all of these things that were making everything smaller and shorter. And I thought, could I sit down with people and talk to them for an hour, old school? school Larry King style and I started doing it and people started digging it and now everybody does it and uh, it led me to all this other strange success that brings me to places like this so it's pretty good. I truly don't know if I could have come up with a more perfect guest for the first episode of the show. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist, author, and founder of Project Reason. You were on Real Time with Bill Maher and you were on to talk about your book, Bill was talking about liberalism and Islam, and Ben Affleck was on, and I know everyone's seen this clip already, but let's take a look. When you want to talk about the treatment of women and homosexuals and free thinkers and, and public intellectuals in the Muslim world, uh, I would argue that li liberals have failed us. And uh, the crucial point of confusion, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank God you're here. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the crucial point of confusion is that, that we have been sold this meme of Islamophobia where every criticism of the doctrine of Islam gets conflated with bigotry toward Muslims as people. Well, hold on, are racist. you the person who understands the officially codified doctrine of Islam? You're uh, the interpreter well, of that, well, so you well, can say, well, I, this I'm, is, I'm, I'm I think actually, any- I'm actually well educated on this topic. I'm, I'm asking you, so I mean, you're you, saying if I criticize the, you're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something- it, Well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it no, really no, isn't. I, I'm not denying not, that, that certain people are bigoted against Muslims as people, that, right. and that's a that's problem. big of you. But the, but why are you so hostile to, about this it's, it's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. Crazy. It's but it's so nuts. It's so. It's like saying it's those so stateless, nuts. shifty Jew. The next day, on all the websites, it was Ben Affleck calls Sam Harris and Bill Maher racist. Is Ben Aff is uh, Bill Maher racist? Is Sam Harris racist? It's almost guaranteed to convince half the audience. Yeah, it's, and I mean, this is something. This is the first thing I said to to Ben afterwards in the green room. I said, you realize, just calling us racist convinced half the people listening and watching that we're racist. I would say this instance with Sam really was the, was the catalyst to really start the change in me. This really was like just sort of like what I thought was a sane, decent, relatively honest liberal who was being treated horrifically by the media. Then what happened is as I started to talk to some of these other people like Shapiro and Beck and Dennis Prager, and then ultimately guys like Thomas Sowell, who I've had the honor of interviewing, and a whole bunch of others. What you suddenly find is, first off, the way they're treated by the media is just completely insane, that these people are not bigots and racists, but that's what the danger is. That was the whole point of that Affleck clip in a way, because it's like Affleck, imagine what it would be like if you were in a conversation with somebody, how long it would take for you to turn and say to them that they're racist, right? Like if you were actually at a bar with someone over a drink and you got into a political debate, it's like it's pretty rare that within the first 45 seconds of that conversation, you would say they're a racist. But what Affleck did was such a perfect example of everything that was happening on the left that then it infected all of these people on the right because people stopped being afraid, people stopped being willing to talk to them. So people were afraid to talk to Shapiro and Beck and some of these guys. And I was just like, hey, I will talk to them. And then I started reading some of their books. But that really, it, it's an important moment for me because in that clip right there, when I sat in that room with him, it, it changed my life. Ben Shapiro to my left, ironically, <laughs> Jordan uh, Peterson to my right. Uh, I believe that we are fully right now in an idea revolution. Nietzsche diagnosed the death of God about 150 years ago. And his, he made three predictions. He said, people will, as a consequence, our culture will shake to the roots, will become nihilistic or totalitarian in response, or will invent our own values. If you, if you stray away from this common set of values, and I'm talking like the most root level values, 
personal responsibility, free will. It's your job to be responsible for members of your family. Uh, it's yep. your job to make good decisions and responsible decisions and not to blame the society around you for failures that you are yourself responsible for. Man, I just got a serious feeling of nostalgia while watching that. It's like, that was a really, really special moment. Well, my original intention was just like, we get these two guys in a room. You know, that really was the first part. I was like, Jordan's in LA at the moment. Ben lives in LA, pretty close to my house. Like, we just get these guys in there because they were both catching fire in such an awesome way. Uh, but I, what I really wanted out of the conversation was could we unearth some new stuff? So I like the idea of here we have an Orthodox Jew talking about personal responsibility and the role of government and all of these things. And here we have someone that's a clinical psychologist who often talks about the Bible, but from a more Christian perspective. And what could we sort of meld together that would give people some of the tools to fight the authoritarianism that is now very obvious here in 2021 but I love the fact that you know somebody will somehow get on YouTube you know maybe search for a Jordan Peterson video or maybe see Ben Shapiro on Joe Rogan and then somehow they'll come across this thing and then two and a half hours later they have listened to these guys argue and agree and disagree about politics and religion and the nature of existence and all of the existential stuff and that it really only is touching politics in a very ancillary way it's, it's pretty awesome, and hopefully it will continue to wake people up for a long time to come. This video is brought to you by Kamikoto. Kamikoto makes great Japanese steel kitchen knives using traditional techniques from Japan. They only use steel sourced from mills in Japan, and each blade is crafted using techniques that have been honed and perfected by generations of bladesmiths. Every knife comes in a beautiful, heavy-duty ashwood box. It makes sure that the knife is stored safely, and it also makes this a wonderful gift can't you see just getting that, opening it up and saying, this person who just gave this to me clearly loves me. Each knife is individually inspected and Kamikoto is so confident about their knives that each knife comes with a lifetime guarantee. Kamikoto is currently having a massive holiday sale and on top of that sale, you can get an additional $50 off any purchase you make with discount code DAILYWIRE. I've used these knives, they are ridiculously sharp. I tried to take this box home with me because after I used them, I wanted them. They told me I wasn't allowed, but I'm gonna go buy my own set. You should do the exact same thing. Just use the code DAILYWIRE again for that discount. So click the link below or go to kamikoto.com slash dailywire and use promo code dailywire to save an extra $50 today. Quick point. The reason I want the government out of the business of marriage is because now that the government has enshrined gay marriage, the next step is going to be going to religious people and telling them they have to engage with same-sex weddings. So as a religious person, this is problematic to me. I want a society in which I can do what I want and I don't have to care what you think and you can do what you want and you don't have to care what I think. Right. That doesn't mean you get to come into my synagogue and get married. It also doesn't mean that I have to go to your gay wedding. Right, and right? That's so a, is, see that's an interesting place to have the discussion because I would argue for gay marriage for the exact reasons. I don't want the government involved in all of these things right. and that's exactly why gay marriage should exist and I think if Rand Paul had hit that point harder, it would have made a sensible libertarian argument I, for I, limited government. and. You know what, tend, you want to marry a dude, go ahead, and you want to smoke weed, you, 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 Right, well, I, I tend to agree with both of those things I agree with. And by the way, I find people who smoke weed unbelievably irritating, but that's not my business. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the beauty of America is you don't have to give a crap what I think. That was the first time I had ever met Ben Shapiro. It was the first time we had ever sat down together. It's so interesting, because I haven't seen this clip in years. And it's like, when I listen to that, it's like, how did that clip get so many people so angry? It's like, here you've got a religious, conservative, commentator basically saying, do what you want. I just don't want it infecting my beliefs and I don't want it being done in you know my place of worship, which, which I as a secular person completely buy in on. And here you have me saying, hey, basically the same thing. Uh, but that's very different than sort of what the mainstream progressive move on this is, which is that the government should do everything for all people all times. But I think what you can see there is the beginning of how Ben and I started to come to agreement on some things. And we've debated plenty of other things, by the way, including the death penalty and abortion and much more. But so many people online and the, tr the Twitter trolls and all the usual haters were like, there's homophobe Ben Shapiro and self-hating gay Dave Rubin and this clip, you've got to see this clip. There's so much evil right-wing hatred in this clip. So actually seeing that after, after a long time, it's like, man, the haters should find better things to hate. Give me the most blatant racist example you can come up with right now. Um, I think you could probably find evidence that in general, 
cops you're, you're, are th that cops are more willing to shoot if the uh, perpetrator is black what's your data than for, white. What's your basis for saying that? L last year- the, Well, look, I know a lot of people would say, look what's going on in Chicago. I, I, right? I know what they would say. Yeah. I'm talking about what the facts are. 965 people were shot by cops last, uh, last year and killed. 4% of them were white cops shooting unarmed blacks. As a black conservative then, who now you've, you've laid out your case there, but you haven't laid out yours. I, so, asked, I asked you to name the most important uh, example of racism, and you gave white cops going after black people. And I, and I told you, gave you the facts for that, so that's nonsense. So what, you must have something else. What else is it? If you think racism well, remains a problem in America, give it to well, me. Well, I think it remains a problem. Give it to, I, it's me. Not, it's give it to not, me. It may not be systemic in that we have, it's not like you're not being hired because you're black. There's no systemic reason, you know, legal reason that that exists, that kind of thing. But I think that racism as a general... Uh, I need some. Theory I need exists. some. I need some specifics. You gave me the white cop thing. What else? Give me another example. What do you think is a problem? The, the biggest burden that black people have, in my opinion, again, mm -hmm. is the percentage of blacks, 75% of them, that are raised without fathers. People always ask me about the famous Larry Elder interview where Larry basically beat me over the head with facts around systemic racism and I was still a lefty and I came to that fight not armed properly and Larry just beat me senseless on camera. And I thank him now for it. Larry is one of my best friends on this planet. He is a mentor. And as you can see, he was ready. He was just ready to say, here's what I believe, here's what I know, how I know it, etc." And I wasn't quite ready, but I think, you know, it's funny watching this. It's like, I can now look back at myself and I was really trying to figure it out. I changed. And so looking back on it, it's pretty sweet. And the fact that Larry and I are good friends now, and I got to open for him on tour when a guy was running for governor of California. Who would have thought that in that moment from five years ago? You have a crazy story, an interesting evolution. You've suddenly caught fire and you're doing pieces all over the place. You were on the Daily Wire this morning. I saw you on Jesse Waters, was it this past weekend, right? Correct. Just a couple days ago. Saw a clip of that. Um, you're bouncing around, you're making moves. Who is this Candace person? All right, so let's just do some history for the people that don't know about you at all. Um, I am, honestly, I'm just, I'm just a girl that makes videos. Uh, the history is I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. I went to school at the University of Rhode Island, um, pursued a degree in journalism, which is quite ironic. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Someone that studied journalism that's trying to yeah. tell the truth? This yeah. is fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. All right, wait, there's so much here and it's so related to everything and we haven't yeah. even fully got to your no. political awakening yet. Yeah. So first off, I love that you said they're, they're hit men. Yes, journalists are journalists. Hit men. Yeah. yeah. My threat was that they actually thought that I had created a technology that was going to unmask trolls. Imagine what that, that would have done that is in incredible. the heat of the election. Hillary Clinton had millions of followers on Twitter. What if I actually created something and said, actually, that's all coming from, that's like, that's like one person, they've created all these accounts. You know, because they're, they're sucking the fun out of everything with all of this virtue signaling, you know, and I don't know what's next, Disneyland? Yeah. Maybe, you know, <laughs> they're coming we're gonna come, yeah, and Mickey's gonna be kneeling down or something, you know, what's going on here? And the toddler's gonna be crying and they're gonna explain that, you know, I don't what do you, know. What don't do you know. think that's about, that sort of like sucking of fun? Because I do think there's a reason, there's a reason the fun I suck. I think there is a reason, if they can keep you miserable all the yeah. time and keep you guilty all the time, yeah. you're very easily manipulated. Manipulated, yeah, it's, it's brainwash. It's, it's, it's a system of mass brainwash. I did not even know her name until we sat in those chairs. We were doing something called YouTube week on my show where I did five shows a week. We would just grab random YouTubers that we thought were doing something kind of interesting. My producer brought me this girl named Red Pill Black who did a video about not being a leftist while still being black. And she had like 30,000 subscribers or something. And I was like, all right, let's book her. And I remember right before we started the show, I had to say to my guy, hey, what's her name? What's her name? Because I only knew her as Red Pill Black. Watching this just now, especially after just a few minutes ago today, I just taped Candice's show in front of, right in this building in front of a live studio audience. It's like, I'm so freaking proud of her. Like, that's what I feel like. Like, she has relentlessly and almost impossibly just fought the machine and fought the odds and fought cancel culture and fought Twitter and Facebook and everything. And she always comes out on the other side and she's stronger and she's more clear in her thoughts and knows what she's thinking. And what she's done, the fact that it had something to do with me, that somehow she ended up on my radar, we put her on that, that first show, I think it's got well over a million views, I'm sure it does, and that that you know, gave her a little bit of juice to then keep going and, and fight through this and become a cultural icon. When you see someone good, 
that is doing something good and you go, man, I had a little something to do with that, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, well, in the midst of this whole thing of interviewing people and talking to the camera and traveling and college gigs and all that stuff and writing a couple books, uh, I started a tech company called Locals.com, which was basically the idea was how could creators own their content, own their user data, make sure that if Twitter booted them or YouTube deranked them or Google deboosted them, any of these ridiculous terms, that they would still be able to communicate with their core audience. And we just did it. And then in under three years, we actually just were acquired by Rumble.com. And I think we're gonna build, not I think, I know, we are going to build a parallel ecosystem online. They can have YouTube, they can have Google, they can have Amazon AWS, they can have Twitter, and we are just going to build better products that are not based on censorship, that are not based on selling your data. You know, if you give people something that's kind of good and, and thoughtful and decent and, and isn't designed to make them angry or dumb or, or stupid or enraged, then it's actually pretty attractive to them. And I believe we can win. David beat Goliath. So I think Dave can beat Google. We shall see.